So, Fred. Um, here been, we are again. Here we are again. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 13 years since you left Ticketmaster and you're back. I guess the first question, welcome back, and how does it feel to be back in the industry again? It's fun. I mean, I always liked this industry. And I think that this is a very unique time in this industry because I do see serious changes coming in terms of the way um, people will buy tickets in the future and, and how the clients are ultimately going to look at the business. Do you see similarities between this environment and say back in 82 when, when Ticketron was the big dog and, and you did what other people said you couldn't do, you transformed the industry, do you see similarities today um, between now and that period? Well, it's different business dynamics, but similarities in the way that um, Ticketron treated their clients and, and the way I see Ticketmaster treating their clients. Um, when we got into business, uh, we're going back 30 years. First of all, nobody thinks they're going to do anything that's going to last 30 years. And this is basically the same model. Nothing's changed. Um, Ticketron had two boxes, if you can imagine this. A box for season tickets, a box for single tickets, and the boxes didn't talk to each other. So trying to comprehend that in today's world makes no sense. 70% of all the tickets were sold at the box office. My view in those days, and Ticketron was not about customer service. They, they, their relationships were basically box office relationships as opposed to relationships with the teams and the owners and the, and the people who ran the clubs or the arenas. And it wasn't a profit center, it was a cost center. And my view is if you were only selling 30% of the tickets, because most tickets were sold at the box office, then you weren't doing a very good job. And we created a lot of funny stuff. We, they used to call them remote outlets, and we sort of word tracked and said a remote outlet was a remote seat. You know, you did a whole host of things in selling best available seat, things that none of you, most of the people in this room, would even think that that was an issue. Um, and they didn't take care of their clients. And when the Live Nation Ticketmaster merger happened, if you look very carefully at that, that's a huge paradigm shift in terms of what's happened. Um, when Ticketmaster was built, Ticketmaster was clearly meant to protect the buildings. That's how I created it. Um, and it was driven in such a way that Ticketmaster was the fall guy for everybody complaining about service charges, um, which all of you face. I always thought it was fascinating that you could go to a broker and pay three times face value and no one would complain, but if you paid Ticketmaster $5, you miserable scumbag, we're going to get you. <laughs> so, you know, it was that kind of dynamic that kind of set this thing up. And in the end, I've always lived with the premise that no one pays more for a ticket than they want. And unlike the two authors in the room, I don't believe anybody ever got scalped. Anybody disagree in this room besides them? <laughs> The fact of the matter is, the ticket business, they're here selling their books. Are they scalping those books or just selling them? We're, we're all in the business to make money. That's the fundamental problem here. And what's very interesting about sports that's different than concerts, and then we'll go back to the point of, that, you, that you raised, is if you see tickets being sold on a website for $20,000 for the Super Bowl, no one uses the adjectives that they use for concerts. And somewhere there's this sense that concert tickets if, if they, they evolve to what the marketplace leads it to, that the public's being ripped off. There's a very funny anecdote in that book which speaks to the whole industry, which is there was a, when, the, when computerized ticketing started, there was a $6 ticket, and the service charge was 25 cents. And they asked somebody at that time who bought a ticket for the 25 cent with, and bought a, the ticket and said, what do you think about the service you got? And he said, I've been ripped off. Now, nothing's changed except these zeros today. That's all. It's the same thing. And so when I looked at the, the, ticket, the uh, uh, Live Nation uh, Ticketmaster merger, where you had a huge paradigm shift is that where the buildings were protected, the acts are being protected. Their whole methodology is about protecting the act. And that's a huge paradigm shift. And that will clearly impact how the primary market perceives the business over the next, I think, three to five years. Because ultimately, what you want is you want someone to be on your side. And clearly, right now, the elephant in the room and what's keeping Ticketmaster strong is the talent, not, not the technology, not the system, not the business, not the relationships. 
And one of the things that you have to think about is Ticketmaster made money. It was a real engine for making money. That I knew how to do. Live Nation never made money. Being a promoter is a ridiculous business. Well, let's talk about that, the, the Live Nation merger. I mean, is that one of the reasons that, that you saw a window of opportunity to get in now? I mean, there was a lot of controversy at the time of the merger. There were congressional hearings. You had Bruce Springsteen getting up and, and making a big deal of it and saying, don't, you know, don't let this pass. But it did. There were some conditions on it, but it did pass. Was this bad for the industry? Well, the marketplace will determine whether it's bad for the industry. It clearly changes the dynamics of the industry. Because once you control the talent, or once you have a large impact of talent, then you can also say, if you want me to bring acts to your buildings, I have to sell the tickets. So you change the dynamic of how you got in the building. And what I find interesting, which is where I think it was the time to come back in the business, was that there was an old, there was an old ad, goes back, I, I can't remember, Brooke Shields did it. She said, nothing should come between you and your Calvins. And it's the same thing in today's world with the internet. Most of the people in this room who are brokers have a direct relationship with their consumer. Now, the internet makes it more impersonal, but the fact of the matter is, for some of you who are dealing with corporate clients and some of you who are dealing with, with certain people who want a certain level of service, you know who you're dealing with. Um, there's no room for a third party to be a middleman anymore for a building or a team. Every team's a brand. Every building's a brand. If you don't believe that, why do buildings pay? Why, do, why, why can buildings get so much money for naming rights? So whether you take the Staples Center, whether you take the United Center, whether you take any building that's got a name on it, that's a brand because someone's paying for that value. Every team is a brand. So ultimately, what you want in today's world is to have that direct relationship with the consumer without having a third party in the middle. And Outbox will not be a name that the public knows other than there'll be a sign that's just powered by Outbox and you might see our name on the credit card slip next to the building. But the fact of the matter is this is all about the building dealing directly with their consumer, with the data belonging directly to the building as opposed to having a third party taking that data and using it to market other things to it. So in those levels, and, and it's various degrees of value to each one of those components, it creates an opportunity. And look, we were, when I got together with John Francois, who I think is one of the most sophisticated and smartest system guys I've ever met, um, and we first started, we didn't expect that we would get AAG um, as a client, notwithstanding they became a partner. But there were, AEG had better offers, AEG had better deals than, than we put on the table. But in the end, they understood the value of relationships, they understood the value of business. And we think competitively that the industry is, is time for a, uh, ready for a shift. Was, and, was part of the, the timing too though, there was a, a consent decree as part of the merger agreement that the DOJ uh, applied and they said in the case of AEG that they had to form a ticketing company within five years. I mean, did you see that and think, wow, this is something I could, you know, and, and uh, since you've since teamed up with AEG. We never thought that. Okay. Um, I would tell you the first three or four months of the negotiations were kind of interesting, but I didn't think they'd lead anywhere. Um, and I didn't certainly go back to work because there was the opportunity for AEG. The, the consent decree also says they're not going to try and mix talent with ticketing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they didn't read that sentence. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a question of who's going to stand up and say, they told this to me, which is, you know, this is not an industry of, of people who tend to stand up. And inertia is a very powerful tool. So what I thought was that if you were focused and if you could provide a good product, that time would allow you to become a significant player in the marketplace. I didn't think about AEG. I thought about other buildings and the ability to, to compete. And my view, nothing's changed in that view. Um, you know, my joke is I look at the, I think Irving's probably the smartest guy in the music business and he's, he's keeping that, that company, you know, it's like a guy with his fingers in the dike holding it all together and at some point he's going to run out of fingers. So that's kind of my view of that. Now what about entering in this economic environment? We, we've come out of a recession where 
people have less money in their pockets, they're not buying as many tickets in the last couple of years. Wouldn't it have been easier to re-enter when the economy is stronger? Well, two things. One is, I think that if you're going to do something, the time to do it is, is against or in contravention of, of normal thinking. You go into a, a business at a time when things are tough because people don't expect you to be in the business and that allows you to lay a foundation. And if you form things when it's raining out, you know at some point nothing's just going to last forever, good or bad. If you have good times, you have to recognize it's a wheel. And I've lived on this planet long enough to know that nothing stays in the same direction all the time. So my view is that um, um, going in now is probably the right time. Uh, you have some issues of economics impacting ticketing. And then you've been blessed with the CEO of Live Nation who says, I can't pay more than 110% of the gross to the act. So how, how are you going to make money doing that? You can't make money doing that. And they put him in charge of the ticket company. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, it's sort of like the kid from Animal House. You know, when the Playboy Bunny winds up in his room, he goes, thank you, God. You know, it's that, that kind of thing. And it's, it's that kind of dynamic that says, look, Ticket business is a hard business. It's a confrontational business. It's a tough business. And the primary market's a very tough business. And it's built on relationships. It's built on, I want you to think of this. You are the only vendor that deals with an arena or a theater 365 days of the year, 24 hours a day. You got to make that system run on Christmas, because when you're sitting home watching a game for tickets that you sold to that was sold out, whether it's a bowl game or a Super Bowl or some big event, somebody's in a box office somewhere, and somebody's in a data center making sure that those things are there for customer service issues. There's no other business like that. And it got built because there was a focus level of people who were totally motivated to make sure that that system ran seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and the CEO didn't play the guitar. The, the, truth of the, mat <laughs> the truth of the matter is, it's a hard business, which will lead to another issue, which is who's your client? The client is the public. The client is the building, not the public. You didn't need a book to find that out. You, you needed to know that ultimately, there's no commodity like a ticket. You know that. If you've got a hot event, you guys never have enough. We never have enough. If you have an event you can't sell, and this goes back to pricing of how badly tickets were, look at the price of concert tickets in the year they had. Overpriced. They'd sell the first third of the house. You guys, and ladies and gentlemen, would sell some of the tickets. You couldn't sell the middle, but there was still the market for some of those premium seats. And you had the back of the house, which you could always sell the cheap seats. And what's been lost in the ticketing business, and I really think it's been lost, is that when I built a business, and I have no vote in this, and I have no stake in this, and after you sell something, you really, you know, anything you say is subject to question. But there was always a balance when we played with service charges. When I left, those balances ended. Um, you know, people could say we had 50% of the service charge. 50% of the value of the ticket was the service charge, but it was a $5 ticket and two and a half bucks on a phone. It wasn't a $40 ticket with a $20 service charge. It wasn't an $80 ticket with a $40 service charge. And the truth is the secondary market served as air cover for us in raising the charges because I believe nobody's, no building, when we created these distribution systems, which you no longer need because of the internet, nobody lives within 10 minutes of an arena. It's not convenient. It's not like a movie theater. And I felt this if you built the distribution systems, people would come. In, in today's world, um, what you're looking at is the internet brings the ability for you to interact directly with your consumer, directly. And you've got to know how to price your product. And then you've got to do something else for tickets. There is nothing like a live event. There's nothing like being in a room with everybody in a live event. And being in that audience is special. But what's interesting is in sports, people know there are season tickets. So if you just get tickets to get in the building, you're happy. But in concerts, if you sit in the back third of the house, if I said to, it doesn't make a difference where you sit in this room. But if I said all of you wanted to sit in the first three rows, you couldn't do it. 
because there just aren't amounts, aren't the same number of seats to do that. So ultimately, somebody's sitting in the back of the house and they go, oh, my friend is sitting 20 rows ahead of me. How did that happen? I know that bad ticket company did it. And people use the ticket company, part of which I created, in, the, in that sense of being the fall guy. And no one in the time that has left, in the time since I've left, has talked about being in the event is what's special. You sit where you sit. There's only so many good seats, and then it goes front to back. And the joy of being in that event and sharing that experience is really important. And so I think that's been lost. And I think that's clearly been lost in the last 13 years. So when I read this fan-friendly stuff, I do my best to keep from rolling my eyes. <laughs> well, what about price discounting? And we, we've seen some you know, coupons and Groupons gotten into the picture this year. Is this, is this risky in the long run? I mean, can fans get used to the lower prices, and then when the economy rebounds, it's tougher to you know, bring prices back to the way they were? Look, Groupon is a very good company, but for tickets, it's rat poison. You want a quote? Whoever wants it, there's your quote. Why is that? Because ultimately, you're destroying your, your marketplace. You're destroying your ability to keep the integrity of your product. The truth of the matter is, baseball, certain sports have lots of tickets to sell. And if they're smart about how they go about doing it, it doesn't have to be 50%. It could be 70%. It could be 30%. But the truth, the way I see the business, is it should be added value. And if you're selling tickets directly to the consumer in your website, you can create offers for people. Four tickets, $20 worth of food and parking. It's a number. Pick a number. But once you go down the road, do I want my tickets to be in a place where someone's selling pizzas at half price or someone's selling spinning for half price? A ticket is a special commodity. You need to get it. That's why everybody talks about them. That's why the politicians talk about, if you look about this, they talk about toxic waste and how serious it is, and that's page 37. But the minute they can talk about how come the public didn't get all the tickets, it's page three. And the fact of the matter is, in all due respect, tick, um, Outbox is agnostic about the secondary market. Our view is that we don't want to be in it. I think Ticketmaster made a terrible mistake when they bought Tickets Now, which I call Tickets Never. Uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that you've got to be very careful or you destroy your product. So if you sit there and you, you, what you want to do is create a commodity, you're in a marketing business. If you ask Broadway whether the half price booth is good or bad, it depends who you talk to. But people have been conditioned that if they wait till the last minute, they can go to the half price booth and get tickets and not pay full value. And that impacts your gross. And the truth of the matter is, you're all connected in a funny way to the primary market because you need inventory on some level. Some of you get it the right way, some of you don't. It's all a combination of the game. But the truth is, nobody pays more for a ticket than they want. And discounting to me, especially in the concert business, is a really slippery slope. So, so what's the answer, though? I mean, at least that it, moves tickets during a recession. Is added, it flex added, pricing or dynamic it's pricing? It's flex or? pricing. It's dynamic pricing. It's added value. It's a whole series of things. And part of re the reason to come back is to give Outbox, was, it was for Outbox as a, as a ticketing system gives the arenas and the, the ability to figure out how they want to do that. We don't tell you how to do it. We can advise you, but ultimately, you, you make the choice of how you're going to do it. And the truth is, let's look at the Groupon deal that Ticketmaster made. Let's assume if you're a client on some level. And then I want to get into this fan-friendly thing, too. It's 50% of face value of which of that, so it's an $80 ticket, it's $40 to the consumer, of which you get 24. So you're getting 30% of the face value, and they're getting 16, and you're not getting data. I only thought people had lobotomies did deals like that. <laughs> now, on fan friendly, you know, I, whatever, they've got all these names running around. Paperless tickets. The law that was passed, and this is going to be our position, the law that was passed in New York is the law that we think is the right law. If you want to be friendly to the fan, it's up to the consumer to decide what they want. 
And I have told various people that I will get involved in this and I will talk to whatever politicians that need to be talked to. And I've got a pretty good track record in terms of dealing with them because under my rule, I never signed a consent. Um, th the truth of the matter is this. It's a business. And trying to regulate tickets is like prohibition. It ain't going to happen. Is it, is it too late then for, uh, for paperless ticketing to take off? I mean, a few years ago, I remember Trent Reznor, for example, his fans, and he, they were sort of outraged that, you know, that, uh, you know, the tickets weren't getting to the fans. They were, you know, being at the, all the resale, resale sites and so forth. And he came up with, uh, I mean, maybe others had too, but I remember his was pretty high profile, where if you had your name printed on the ticket and you could only pick it up with your credit card and so forth, it would stop that. But you say you think it should be just... The event is the show, not getting into the arena. Um, <laughs> Look, there is a different dynamic with all of this. And, and the dynamic is that, as I said before, Irving's very smart. This is about the acts controlling all the money. They don't want anybody else to make money but them. Call it anything you want. I know I'm going to be quoted walking out of here. This is all about Irving getting all the money. Make no bones about this. <laughs> if Irving represented painters, you'd be buying art, and then the artist would have the right to when you sell it again to get a piece of that also. So, you know, it's a commodity. You sold it, it's gone. Next. But if the fan wants it, it should be a choice. If the consumer wants it and they want to have a paperless ticket, they have that right, make it non-transferable, that's okay. But it's not up to anybody, the building, the team, or the arena, in my opinion, to have control afterwards. You'd sold, you got your money, go on. You're going to give me a discount if I can't transfer it? No. I mean, look, look at what happened with Rihanna with the fire. I mean, think about this. And she said, and she got off stage early. Live Nation, once again, being customer friendly, says there's no refunds. <laughs> right? So you know, you know it's only a matter of time before the ever popular lawyers show up with a class action lawsuit. You know. So that's the perspective of all of this. And I think from a, a point of view, when I go back to this and I say it to this group, you want to price your tickets accordingly. You want to price your tickets in a way that means something. If you have tickets left to sell, you want to do it in a way that doesn't destroy the integrity of the product you have. And you do not want to recondition people on how to buy tickets. That's really important. And the smart people get it, and the dumb people don't. And that's why you have people running Ticketmaster today who have never been in a ticket business. So it's a different dynamic. And you have to understand what all the different agendas are. Now just getting back to you, when you were building Ticketmaster, when I spoke to some people in the industry when I was researching your profile, um, you were called a number of different names. You were called charming. You were called profane. You were called genius. You were called a bulldog. <laughs> intimidating, control freak, and gutsy. Are those fair adjectives? And is that part of your success? This, I mean, they all seem to agree that your larger-than-life personality, your business savviness, were what made Ticketmaster a success. You know, when you live in that environment, you never thought about the adjectives. I think to be a good CEO, you have to be a chameleon. You can't talk to the guy who runs the Philharmonic the same way you talk to an agent or a rock and roll promoter or a building manager. And I think at different times, you're a different person. I think you have to be smart enough to understand that one way doesn't work. And you're in a business where you're crafting a whole new profit center. You're crafting a whole different way of how people did business. It wasn't a dollar ticket. I remember I was sitting in Houston. I learned a lot in Houston before I became CEO of the company. I was special counsel for Ticketmaster. And we were talking about the Houston Rockets. And I, and you know, Everything comes from experience, and you learn more from what you don't, you screw up than what you know. In other words, if you did it right, you don't learn anything, because you figured that out. But if you did it wrong, you don't make the same mistake twice. So we're sitting in the room, and they had $40 tickets, and they had $5 tickets for the Houston Rockets. I'll never forget this. And I said, why is the service charge a dollar on a $40 ticket? And they said, well, because on a $5 ticket, you can't have more than a dollar. I said, well, why can't you have $2? on the $40 ticket and the dollar on the $5 ticket, which is common sense. I mean, that's third grade math. And they said, 
oh, you can't because you can't have more than one service charge on the same event. And I looked at them and said, was that one of the tablets Moses dropped? <laughs> I, I never got it. M most of what I did when I built the business was common sense. I'm not a business guy by training. I'm a lawyer by training, deal guy. And I sat in a room and I looked at things from an outsider's perspective and said, this doesn't make sense to me. And the bet I made when we built it was that people wouldn't go to the box office anymore if it was convenient. And now, no one goes to the box office at all because so much of the business is done on the internet. So outlets don't mean anything and phones are more about customer service. So if you go back and you go back to those adjectives, I think I called myself, I, I, I never thought of it like that. I, I read some of that. I mean, you know, I read your article, obviously. You know, charming, profane, and genius in the same sentence is difficult to comprehend. <laughs> so it's, it's all about, you just kind of say, you are who you are. I'll tell you this. I never went to work in the 16 years I ran Ticketmaster, and I haven't gone to work in the time I've come back and done this. This is fun. This is, I don't know why I like this industry, I just do. I feel comfortable here, I understand what it is. And so it's, you know. And you've also never been afraid to speak your mind no matter who you're speaking to. I mean, I, I know you've butt heads with and, and also done business with some of the biggest people on Wall Street, uh, Barry Diller, uh, Paul Allen, Bill Gates. I mean, is that part of your success, being able to speak your mind no matter who you're speaking to? Um, I think I've always been candid, and, and people s said to me that um, I lacked an edit button. Maybe that's a good way to put it. <laughs> my, wife is, my wife, Nadine, is sitting in the front row, and she says that to me all the time. But, but the fact of the matter is I, I always knew when to lack the edit button because I think part of it is that if you're not afraid, too many people are afraid, w what's going to happen? You know. I, there have been articles about allegedly how tough I am, which I always get a kick out of. If there's a fire, I'm not running in the building, I'm running out. <laughs> Those guys are tough. The guys in our armed services are tough and brave and we owe them a lot. Our police, our police, our police guys are tough. We sit in a room and chase inanimate pieces of paper. Some days we're right, some days we're wrong. But what's interesting is when you're successful, people give you all those attributes. And I don't think you think about them when you do them. And for me, what was interesting was sitting in the room with all those people was sort of a, wow, you're sitting in the same room. So, you know, like, cool. And, you know, if you're going to sit in a room, you're there to make a point. And it wasn't that you had to be right all the time. You just had to be right more than you were wrong. And the truth of the matter is, and this is the thing that every, you're not running for office. So some people liked you, some people didn't like you. I mean, I had a joke, Jay Pritzker was my mentor and Jay was really a great guy. And it was a if I didn't have a guy like him, I couldn't have built Ticketmaster because it was that kind of, it was just he and I, there weren't a board, there weren't 20 people in a room, there wasn't everybody second guessing, I had total freedom. And I once said to Jay, he said, how would you describe, you know, we were talking about people and I said, when you walk in a room, you're a presence. When I walk in a room, people choose up sides, and when Irving walks in a room, people arm themselves. <laughs> so it's a different kind of dynamic, and I think you have to be careful about the fact that if you're going to build a business and run a business, you have to be able to take the heat that goes with it, and you have to be able to take the fact that not everyone will like you, and if you're going to sit in a room, then they better hear you. So those things never bothered me. I mean, I thought that was kind of fun. And we wanted to open up for questions. Um, there will be three people with mics in different parts of the room. So just raise your hand. Fred will point to you, and a mic person will walk over to you. There's a gentleman there who I can't see. Stand up and say your name. When nobody gets anonymous. <laughs> you gonna hold it? Hey, Fred. Lance Patania, prominent ticket service. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you in this light after many years of knowing you in a different light, first and foremost. But my question for you is, what do you uh, think of Azoff and how broker unfriendly he is and his plans are to try and eliminate all of us? I think I said it. 
I mean, look, Irving's very smart and Irving wants to control all the money. You know, fan friendly is not all the money. In the end, fan friendly is choice. And look, exclusives exist in arenas the way exclusives exist for everything in an arena. From who does the parking to who does the food to who, whether it's a beer, whether it's a soda. Exclusives are the way of life. So the primary business that it's an exclusive is not the issue. But Irving wants to control the secondary market too. And the truth of the matter is the secondary market is prohibition. Look at all the guys in this room, men and women. When I say guys, it's equal. Forgive me. A lot of you have your own business. There are significantly more brokers in America than there are primary ticket companies. And when you think of primary ticket companies, there are only two that count. Ticketmaster and us, and everybody else is the minor leagues. I have another quote, whoever wants it. The truth of the matter is, that's the nature of the business. You are much more of a fragmented industry that has not been rolled up on various levels. And StubHub is probably the biggest player in terms of gross dollars because of what they do with eBay. But there's still a lot of mom and pops in the business, and there's still a lot of you. And you know what, what Irving is smart enough to understand is that talent can get you. I mean, in the 80s, Irving said, if you don't let us do the merchandise, we're not giving you the acts. Now it's, we don't let you do the tickets. Now it's, I want the secondary market. It's the same act. Nothing's changed. So, you know, he's smart. I give him credit. I mean, you know, I told him, I once said something that he got an award from the American Dental Association because he got more extractions in a year than any dentist. <laughs> There's somebody over there? Did I? No? OK. Gentlemen. Uh, my name is Vassal, clickticket.com. Uh, Fred, m going back in into your career, I'm very curious about the change. You were a lawyer for 10 years in New York. And then all of a sudden, you, you, you sort of quit everything and decided to become a CEO of, of Ticketmaster. And uh, I was just wondering, what were you going through at that time? I mean, being a lawyer in New York could be a well-paid job. And then you sort of change everything and go into something you don't really know about that much. And then uh, well, how was it for you, I mean, that transformation? And what would you advise us here as all entrepreneurs sitting here? Well, I was always a maverick, even practicing law. And I had my own firm. I've never worked for anybody. So you've got to start with that premise. Um, before I left my practice to run Ticketmaster, there was a guy in Chicago named Bert Canner. And Bert um, invested in a lot of small companies between three and five million dollars. He'd put, you know, he'd raise money from his friends. And, was, and I became special counsel to those companies. And you're a lawyer, you know, and you know, basically my job was to make sure that no one took any money and that the businesses ran and, okay. Ticketmaster was one of those companies. And it was running out of money. And what was interesting was the Chicago White Sox had signed a letter of intent with me in April that basically said they would become a client on three conditions. One, we'd tell them who our outlets would be in the summer. Two, we'd have a data center up in Chicago by the fall. And three, we'd get the company financed. Now, I'm a commercial animal. I make no bones about the fact of that. I, I, I mean, I figured out. You know, sometimes I've been right. In my career, I've been on all sides of the wheel. So, you know, I saw in this business that if someone was willing to make that kind of a deal on those conditions, they weren't jumping out of a third story window. They were walking off a curb. And basically, I saw Ticketron as footprints in sand. And I said, that's really compelling. And I always wanted, I always had this thing about wanting to run a business. I practice law. When, you, when you're a lawyer, you live by other people's focus or dreams. And I'd sit in rooms in meetings and I'd say, we could get more. And the client goes, no, you got enough. And you have to be respectful of the client. And I always saw things a little differently. And I wanted my own chance to fail. And so when that opportunity came along, I went, I, I called a friend of mine in Chicago who came out and spent time with me. And I said, talk me out of doing this because I think I've lost my mind. I want to go do this. And he said, I think you're right. And then to make a long story short, I wound up sitting with Jay and Jay wound up funding it. So we became partners. And I would tell you the first two years, I missed all my numbers. 
I was as close to my numbers as China is to Las Vegas. I mean, you know, <laughs> maybe further away. I mean, you know, but I had patient capital, and Jay was very good to me in the early years. And we stayed friends his whole life. I mean, Jay was like, an, I, you know, was like a second dad to me. So in the world of finance today, if I look at this industry, it's bland. There's no colorful people. Um, you know, people are, it's pretty dry in, in terms of where it used to be fun. And, you know, I'm, I'm too old to change. I am who I am. And if you really believe in a product or you believe, I, I see Wall Street chasing so many companies in this business. I've never seen so many ticketing companies being funded. The, I think Eventbrite sells tickets to bar mitzvahs now. They collect money and <laughs> you get a thing and a ticket. It's great. It's a, it's a great thing. And they got $50 million and this one gave you $20 million and two guys get off a plane from Nepal and they're in the ticket business. It's great. Everybody's in the ticket business. <laughs> but very few people are going to make money and very few people are going to scale. Bob Groder from New Jersey. Stand and up. <laughs> Bob Grotter from New Jersey, and uh, my question is, where do you see the industry five years from now? No, I can't do that. One year at a time. One year from now. <laughs> One year at a time. I think more people are going to wind up doing it themselves and understanding that they can do things in, inside their own websites, which will make their websites and their ability to communicate with their consumer much more valuable. I think if you guys stay focused on this, and I mean this, the buildings or the fans will have a choice. Don't bend on that point, but you have to stand united as an industry. And you have to get past the fact that you've got to learn word tracks better. It's like, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to do pop. No, leave that alone. The, the fact that it matters, it's the messaging. And you've got to get the message out that to be fan friendly or to take care of the public, it's their choice. And you've got to, you've got to attach Trying to control the secondary market is like prohibition. Couldn't control it, can't regulate it, can't keep it. Was this one more question? Gentleman in the back. How you doing? I'm Eve Darboos. Um, I'm one of the uh, competitors to you guys that don't matter. <laughs> we, we believe that. Uh, uh, What's, what company? Charge.fm. Uh, we, we're a brand Who? new. <laughs> I couldn't exactly. hear you. I'm, I'm not being funny. Who? Charge.fm. We're a new ticketing software. Uh, our, our application currently gets 46,000 unique visitors. And uh, the question, question being, how does, how does it happen that large companies like AG Live end up using Ticketmaster for, for their ticketing for all these years and until this new out-the-box out deal happens and allows them to basically just cannibalize their data? Uh, giving away their data and ticketing information. How does that happen that a company as large and sophisticated as that makes such a wrong digital mistake? Well, they changed. So they, they knew it, and they, that's why they left and why other companies will leave. But, but here's the point, and you said, you know, while I was trying to be glib or funny, here's the fact of why most of these companies are not going to get a, AEG type business. Because you're a software company. You're not a ticket company. There's a very subtle difference in that. What do you, I mean, I'm not trying to make it personal to you, so it's not about that. This is a business that resists change. This is not a business that embraces change. It moves slowly. And the fact is they gotta deal with a comfort level of who they're gonna deal with on a primary market. And a software salesman comes in and sells software and leaves, but they don't understand the business. You gotta understand the rhythms of the business. You've gotta understand the dynamics of the business. You've got to know who the players are, who the agents are, who all the promoters are. You've got to have a whole list of things that most of these little companies will never have. I, was at, I went to the Billboard conference. I had never been to that because when I first came back and some girl from some company, I don't know, no ticks, few ticks, one day I'll have ticks, one of the... <laughs> she, she said, how can it be a convenience charge if you have to pay more than a dollar? And you look at her and go, that's nice. <laughs> because it's a profit center. And because you're dealing with a lot of money. And the fact of the matter is, it's about protecting revenue streams. And whose revenue stream is it? Is it the buildings? Is it the acts? Because Ticketmaster has eroded what the Live Nation 
Ticketmaster merger is done is saying that the acts have the power. For those of you who remember the Pearl Jam mess, the acts didn't have the power. And under my watch, they didn't have the power. And that switched. And the question is, how far is this going to go? And I want to move the pendulum back the other way, where the buildings are totally in control of what they want to do. And that's why I came back, because I think that opportunity exists to do that. And I think it's hard. I think that from an intellectual point of view or from a business point of view, the question you raise is right. Why do some of these buildings allow that? I agree. But they're not going to cross the bridge to a software company and put their inventory there. They're just not going to do it. Thank you so my much. Opinion. Um, Janet and Fred, thank you. A round of applause, please, for our speakers. <laughs>